welcome and welcome to the galaxy's greatest this is a panel talking about a fantasy nerve center i'm going to be your panel host scott weatherly podcaster and uh, 2000 ad fan uh, gratuitous just plug for myself i'm the podcasting host of 20th century geek and today i'm being joined by some uh great of uh more recent and legendary status for me at least but uh it's an honor to be meeting and a pleasure to be talking with i'll go around the room uh from top to bottom uh, simon fraser how are you doing you Hi. okay i'm good thank you nice Excellent. to see you nice to see everybody yeah thank you for joining Welcome me to my studio <laughs> I will be poking at some of the things in behind people's backs as well, by the way, because I've already started looking at books on shelves and mm. that will, I will pick up on that. Uh, I'm also joined by uh, PJ Holden. How are you doing? You okay? Hello. I'm very well. Thank you. Yes, I'm good. I'm good. Excellent. And also all the way from the, oh, sorry, all the, way from the States, because also Simon, you're in the States as well, but uh, yeah. true American, actual American, uh, Leanna Kangas. How are you doing? You okay? I'm doing absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. No, thank you all for joining me. So today, as I say, this is a fantasy nerve center. This is for us to talk about if we were to be running the nerve center, you may see uh, the great one is sat behind us, actually just keeping an eye. Um, we can do anything we want. We have got the nerve center for the day. Uh, it's going to be a jumping on issue. We've got five sort of strips that we can do and we can throw ourselves in and we can choose anything past, present. Or if you've actually got an idea, plug it now. Now's your pitch. There you go. We can sort of do pitches as well. Um, but we'll go around the room and we'll start this. And I have a, t I have a feeling it may wander off. And I'm, I am going to encourage <laughs> anecdotes and tangents because uh, the fans love all this stuff. Uh, so let's go. Any thoughts? What, if we, you know, if we were going to do this, then I, I, ha I have, a, I have a thought because this is an exercise I've played before. Oh, where I've kind of thought, what would I do? What would I do if I was Stark? I, I wrote a big uh, uh, post. I think it was on the comics uh, 2004 one time, which was the suggestion that there's a really good uh, video game to be made of being editor of 2000 AD, where you allocate resources based on page rates, where you go, you know, you can have one Carlos Sosquera for five, I don't want to insult anyone, but, but we all know there's a person who's worth a fifth of a Carlos Sosquera. <laughs> Maybe it's me. I don't know. But like, <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't going to say. <laughs> no, I, I know you're too. Throw yourself under the bus I, there. I <laughs> so, yeah, someone has to be thrown under the bus, and it, it's got to be me. Um, so I always kind of think, you know, if, like for example, everyone wants Wagner dread all the time, but John Wagner can't do dread all the time. He's going to be exhausted. So you've got to think of how how do you manage that? There's sort of interesting resource management game in that whole arena. But the problem is the problem that I think I will have, and and Simon might have the same, is that um, I is that we're of such an age that if you say what's your fantasy two thousand AD, there's a good chance Simon and I might both go, oh I don't know, Prog three hundred, let that be an end to it, <laughs> <laughs> just that one, and then just have a scuttle off and check <laughs> what was it, what was in that, yeah, yeah. okay. And, uh, I've spent a good deal of think time was... thinking about this, yeah, because it's like I, I don't want us to become like an old man prog. Because it could be that. I mean, Prog 300 is like, oh, yeah, all the great dangerous. stuff. Yes. So I'm trying very hard to think of modern stuff. Otherwise, I'm going to well, feel... Yeah, I, I, suspect, I suspect Liana. Uh, Liana I don't know how to pronounce her name wrong. I feel bad. Liana? Oh, it's Liana. Yeah. Liana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Liana. Yeah, Liana. Um, you've probably got more of a handle on... Like, I'm in danger of going, well, let's have a Dave Gibbons uh, Rogue Trooper and let's have a Mike McMahon Dread and let's have an Alan Moore Future Shock. And there's a perfect issue of 2018, no matter what way you cut it. And it's and it's like, yeah, but none of those people are going to do that. <laughs> it's funny that you brought that up because I was like, what if we could convince Dave to just like shepherd and co-write with like some uh, like American comic writers or something? to like co-write something, which would be interesting to me. Um, mm. But I, I only mentioned that because you brought up Dave Gibbons, so. <laughs> Who, yeah, on that then, <laughs> Leanna, if you were, sorry, let's, let's run with that then. So if you were to do that, have someone shepherded in, and we were going to bring in some new American talent um, to do that, who, who, are you, who would you th be thinking then? Who would, you know, who would you other, um, I was going to say Yanks then, but other, other Americans you'd bring on? Uh, non Brits, non Brits. Non -Brits. Yeah, non -Brits. Yeah. Well, can Let's I also answer people. Brits because I would love to mm. see like a Rom v uh, like Judge Death story, Judge mm. Morgus. Wait, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, what Death One dead of judges? Them. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, actually, yeah. There's four of them, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, all four would be cool too. I do a whole on running, ongoing. 
I know I can only choose one, but you know. I haven't not? actually read some of his stuff, but I have done a strip with him at some point. But I don't. I, I hear he's very really? good. Really? Yeah. I, I want to hear only, more about The only that stuff of his I've read is like three pages I drew of his. So it's like, wow, okay. <laughs> okay. I've read some of his shores. It's very good. Yeah. And I think some of his uh, Swamp Thing's very good as well. I yeah. think I think he bring, he would bring in a different perspective to, to 2000 AD that, that mm-hmm. it needs. I mean, I, 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 I love 2000 AD, but I can't get away from the fact that I, uh, uh, a middle-aged white man, uh, is the predominant creative type and the predominant reader of 2000 AD. Can't get away from it. Uh, and it interesting. means that sometimes... Hmm? Sorry. The interesting thing you're, you're bringing up here is that, that we are the generation that grew up with 2000 AD, the first generation that yeah. grew up with 2000 AD and then moved into it as an adult yeah. career, yeah. which is the first time that was possible. But now the people are coming in have come are coming from all kinds of different places because we were kids. Yeah. The only thing that was, existed was 2008. It was the only thing we could read, r- roughly incomparable. So, but now of course there's an awful lot more things and people coming in from much more wider and more diverse backgrounds, which is much much better because it gets a little incestuous. You know, it used to be it's like yeah. old 2008 conventions back in the 90s. It's a little bit, you know, boys' locker room, and it's too much of the same ideas being re- regurgitated. And I think yeah. that would be. Yeah. The, my ideal prog, much as I love the old stuff, and I'm going to go back to that, is that we get some new stuff in as well and, and, and re- re-energize the whole thing because it needs it all the time. Yeah. That was the whole I point of it. It was agree. like it was punk. You know, mm, 2008 yeah. was punk, and punk was the thing that hit the mainstream hard and everyone was reeling from it. And 2008, because of that, because of claiming that title of being the punk sci-fi title, they have to keep oh, yeah. doing it. They have to. Anyway, I would point out, though, that I don't like change. I'm, I'm old now. I don't like any kind of Setting change. Your ways. So, Too bad, PJ. So, so, if yeah. we have, so if we can have an issue of 2000 AD, all new and all punk and all different, and also like an issue 300, just that I could just... Yeah. You know, I can you, you hold want on to like this. You want, you, you see, so you basically want well, sort of like... I want the very new... and. The, I want the very, I want the very new, the very latest, completely out there ideas that we've never seen before, but exactly the same as the ones that we've had. So if we could do that <laughs> somehow, then I would, I would, you know, I mean, I'm not. I would buy to, that. Just... <laughs> well, that's one of the things I think that's interesting in, in, in having <clears throat> um, uh, Leanna talk about this is obviously sort of like there are older characters that new talent coming through can revitalize. Um, obviously, you did Tyranny mm. Rex. Um, a wonderful character that yeah. clearly needs a resurgence. How have you not touched base on that? I'm sorry. How have I been the only person so far? Uh, which I'm, I'm already like looking back at it. Like, can I redo that? Like, I'm. I want to do more. Do the fascinating her, character. But... Yeah, and I, I think there are some characters in the vault, as it were, that mm-hmm. would be interesting to get sort of uh, wheeled out. Um, you know, not to be, not to be sort of again that, that that sort of like the old man, the old man of the ship sort of thing. But like my time is in those early nineties, and I often think back to like Finn. Um, uh, there's like, like Maniac Five. There's got sort of really weird, obscure characters. And I'm always mm. like, man, I wish someone would pick those up and try them again. Um, so, I mean, I'd, I'd quite like work? to see something. I, I'd, I'd quite like to see, see Rick Remander come in and do something on some of those those older concepts i think he, he has a he's a really good handle on on kind of sci-fi stuff and and could introduce something new into those ideas that that um you know that we maybe haven't seen yet uh, but but at the same time be quite both quite old, touch and base with quite old stuff and, and be quite new and quite different you know but i mean my, my fear like i for an ideal for the difficulty i have with with coming up with an ideal a version of 2080 is i always i always it's a weird thing but i like seeing a script that as a story that artwork and story that actively repels me something that is so <laughs> not to my taste that i take one look at it and think well that's a waste of six pages because it means someone else is getting something mm-hmm. that i'm not right. i mean it's so if it's so sort of against what i like then it means somebody else is getting it and that, I think, is one of the strengths of an anthology title. Obviously, yeah. I want everything in it to be exactly what I want. But as I've discovered, yeah. when I think I want stuff and I get given exactly that stuff, I think, this isn't the stuff I wanted. <laughs> it's, it's so yeah, weird. I, mean, I, it's- I remember when, when John Hicklinton first appeared in 2008, <laughs> he started Nemesis. And he was just like, what the hell? Yeah. I mean, that's, just yeah. Like, that's just wrong. And I thought, wait, 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 wait. Wait, am I now the generation that looks back and goes, ugh? 
And my, is this what people <laughs> thought Kevin O'Neill looked like when they first saw Kevin O'Neill? It's like, oh no, I'm old. Um, <laughs> but I mean, John Hicklinton, at rest his soul, is, is no longer with us. But that's exactly the kind of thing, like challenging stuff. And Pat Mills, bless More him, he's very, very good at bringing. Yeah. Yeah. But he's, mm-hmm. it's 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 not good. It's not classically good. It's it's provocative. It's mm-hmm. powerful. And, you know, it can't always be that. It can't be um, some kind of like weird underground comic where we're just like constantly mm. pushing you back because then no one would read it. But it periodically has to challenge you. Otherwise, it's not. That's not the punk aesthetic, which was supposed to be what we're all about. And I think 2000 AD can get a little safe. And I think periodically it needs to give you a kick in the nuts. And that's that's part of the nature of the beast. And I, I look forward to seeing more of that. Um, I- I think that's why as an American, like I find a lot of 2080 characters so iconic because uh, there's a lot of potential in a lot of different ways that maybe continuity is not always 100% like required because of this being an anthology format. And so, I mean, there's characters like, you know, Halo Jones and um, I even like, I read The Brink, uh, like I'm pretty obsessed Mm. with it. And I know that that's, you know, by Dan and INJ, but like, it would be so cool to see something else in that realm, you know, done by other creative teams, uh, just Hmm. building off of like these already iconic, yeah, um, things. Well, more like space murder opera, but yeah, Hmm. definitely. I mean, this is interesting because 2080, sorry. No, you can go ahead, Sam. I mean, 2080 has these because of certain writers dominance over the years they've got little yeah. realms unto themselves most notably pat mills who's got his own little universe and um mm-hmm. and um you know uh, dan abnett and, and and rob williams has, t- has annexed his area of the dread verse which is his with his characters and you know they they all they, they all have a little continuity unto themselves but they don't necessarily fold well together because no one's ever thought it through there's no continuity cop there's no e nelson bridwell but, but, that, but that's i think that's I mean, the that's... great part about it yeah absolutely yeah agreed so, I mean, that's the thing I love about Dread artwork is that is that a, a, a Mike McMahon Dread would sit very uneasily in a in a Steve Dillon uh, Mega City One plug mm-hmm. plug. <laughs> Speaking of uh, favorite Dread artwork, uh, no uh-huh. no biggie, Jamie. Uh, <laughs> like, just I only brought that out because I was like, I would love to see an entire Dread run done by him. Mm-hmm. Who, who's that? Who's that? Is that Jamie McKelvey? Sorry. Oh, Jamie. Oh, Jamie yeah. McKelvey. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. <clears throat> so, do you think yeah, then, just, I, sorry, yeah, so, just, just, just a question, you know, so this idea of the punk um, and this, you know, this idea of new, do, you, do you think then that, you know, you, you tend not to repulse readers, but do you think sometimes you need to, you say you need to shock readers then? There needs to be this, you know, if we were to start this, this, this issue and it's all new, everything was like, you want to be sort of like, like an electric shock, like each, you know, as you said, PJ, sort of like you may not want to read every strip in it because you go, that's not for me, but like you say, it's getting for someone, but you want to be, you want like a buzz, I, I think. I'd, I'd like to see a spread across genres. I and mean, I think I think something 2000 AD introduced quite late into its run was horror stories, you mm. know, stuff that was more more just pure horror. And um, I would, you know, I, an ideal issue I think would contain a horror story of some kind. Um, I don't know if you've read any of Junjo Ito's horror stuff, but mm-hmm. something in, in that line would be amazing yeah. in 2080. I think it's, you know, short horror stories that are genuinely upsetting, but at the same time, they, they don't follow the sort of typical, like, they, they don't have the same sort of narrative that, that um, to, uh, Western stories and 2080 stories in particular have. They don't necessarily have that same beginning, middle, and end. Here's the plot. It's more of a, Here's a thing. Here's a thing that's going to leave you feeling very uneasy and uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And I think that you know something like that would be great in 2080. And in fact, it wouldn't. Even, I mean, it wouldn't even be a bad thing if there was a dread strip that had an episode like that. You know, it would be. It'd be quite interesting to see that mixture. Just I mean, the future shocks have been periodically horror. I mean, the the one. <laughs> oh that's, yeah, that's, one of those terror the tales. There are Maso, Massimo Bloodinelli with the time travel story, where by the end, mm. like the machine goes back and forwards in time, but the guy in sight ages in normal time. So he basically yeah. is. A this emaciated corpse at the end which is like an image yeah. is just stuck in my head since i read it <clears> as a kid um and i would love to see a massimo massimo blood and early horror comic that would be fantastic yeah um i was about you know, to say, say i mean the, 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 
Oh, I was going to say the issue that I was in was the body horror issue. And that was one of the first times I've even as an American, like seeing horror comics that are like serialized or like, you know, mm. and so it kind of introduced me to the fact that like, oh, things like this can get published, which mm. is still wild. And you're right. It doesn't necessarily have to have a beginning, middle and end. It can just be like mm. a blip of a scene and not necessarily it's, it's the need thing to do I, anything I other than short... shock you. Yeah. yeah, it's the thing I love about this short story format, which is sort of inherent in all of 2000 AD's things, is that you, you are you can craft these lovely, delicate little jewels that don't have mm -hmm. to exist in a big shimmering set. They they are just they're just perfect little bejeweled beauties of their own uh, their own little thing. Uh, I mean, I I'd like to see some sort of war story stuff as well. That that I mean, with 2000, I wouldn't it wouldn't have to be straight war stuff, but I mean, road troopers. I was like madly in with Road Tripper when I was a kid. Um, still like it, but find it difficult to draw. <laughs> it's, one of, it's one of those things you kind of think, oh, I really want to do that. Then you get given the opportunity, you think, oh, I don't really want to do that. I, <laughs> I, what I really wanted was to be Dave Gibbons drawing this. That's what I really wanted. <laughs> <laughs> don't think I wanted to be me drawing it. Um, but, you know, kind of war story horror type things or war story sci-fi things, something like that. Um, I mean, I, like, and I, I know this isn't, it's not the way 2080 normally works. They're normally sort of ongoing episodes and always constant ongoing things. I find the longer stories not necessarily to my taste. I much prefer the shorter uh, in, in total, you know, um, like just these perfect five or six page stories. I just, I love them. So, you know, an ideal 2080 issue for me is just composed entirely of one-offs. <laughs> it's yeah. like we're getting back to back short stories, each one looking different each one feeling different each one kind of you can pick up any of them and read it and and then and linger over it for days you know so I'd, I'd have something like the um there's a story which i'm always talking about which is the time machine by alan moore and um uh, jesus redondo which is mm -hmm. about a guy who as he's looking back he's traveling through time looking back over the invention of the time machine and um I don't want to spoil this, but I mean, it's a twenty. It's like a forty-year-old story at this point, so I, I will spoil it. Um, he's he's traveling through time and, and reminiscing about all the all, all the great times he had, and and then his obsession with building the time machine, and finally, and his his wife and kids, and him ignoring his children, and his and his wife and his wife leaving, and uh, and he's saying all this as always, uh, you know, like a like in a, like he's in a time stream, and towards the end, you realize that uh, he reveals that. He, he was totally unsuccessful in inventing the time machine. In fact, he jumped off a bridge. And that's what the story is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> it's like, what? There's no sci-fi element to this. What is this? Um, Classic. But an amazing, stuck with me from the age of 13, just constantly in my did, head. Um, did Alan Moore ever do a dread? I don't remember. I don't think I he did. Don't I don't think, think he so. ever did. I don't think he did. Okay, that's my fantasy thing here. It's like if Alan Moore did a <laughs> dread, because it would dread. be this. It would be this six-page perfect execution of the perfect dread story, and then he would walk away in a half, and that would be yeah. that would be it. And we'd all be trying to to rediscover that story <laughs> thirty Alan, years Alan later. Alan Moore's done. He's done ABC Warriors. That was amazing, mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. which is um, by Steve Dillon. And he mm. did um, he did a, a Rogue Trooper story, which is also amazing. Mm. And every time he kind of went in, he wrote a perfect, beautiful short story. Yeah. And, 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 and that was it. And the, yeah, yeah. It was almost like, this is what I want to do. And I'm done. So, That's it. Um, Off we go. Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, the whole American but, comic know. book industry is still sort of reeling in his wake. 30, 40 years later. <laughs> well, just to say, uh, Leanne, we're sort of talking about the short story, the, the format of the book. Um, you know, we have the great sagas, and these, and, and as PJ is saying, these sort of like short one offs. What are your thoughts on that? As, as sort of like, you know, coming into this and seeing this from a different perspective, that idea of those sort of six page, was it six to eight pages, isn't it? Those sort of like short, sharp chapters of either a one off. It's, it's six pages for Dread, but typically mm. four or five pages for other stories. So it's, it's, so it's actually even shorter than yeah. you might think. But um, they're physically larger pages, so you get more in them. Yeah, I was about to say, like, I I have a fascination with the magazine format in general, um, especially never having had uh, collected it prior to working on it. Um, I now collect, you know, a ton of copies, or at least uh, I try to find them when I can here. It's like a gem. Usually it's in Canada when I can finally find them. Um, but it's, I mean, it's my favorite format but i do think it might be tied to the fact that like 
comics, uh, horror comics are kind of like among my favorite genre and I already love sci-fi a lot. And so it's nice to discover, it's a risk free way to discover favorite creators without having to buy an entire book and something that you can have, you know, sent to your house is incredible. Um, the only thing that I kind of wish was done is like large collections of it, like hardcover collections or like, or at least for us in the States, I don't know if they exist, um, over there, but, uh, that's been so far my only, uh, differentiation I, between I would, how I, I love, work as a collector, you know, and a reader. I, I would love to see collections of the comic in every strip in it in the order so you could read issue one, issue two, mm. prove one, prove two, and so, yeah, like so I'd love to see something that. something like that thick. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I, that would be I really cool. Really remember, I vaguely remember 10, 15 to 20 years ago, I think 2008, had a bunch of CDs that they were selling with with the first few mm. CD I would dig some stuff yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, do, I do actually remember those the CD run volume yeah, yeah. And I, I, Simon you know, brought but... up the uh, Shonen Jump like I would kill for a newsprint just so yeah. it's not precious yep. and like you can actually yeah. read it and like get your hands on it versus like I know when I crack open one of the image hardcovers and like I have to wash my hands before I open this and like <laughs> one, you, you can see on. the grease like mm, i mean true. and so one of my favorite books is like this massive this one of dylan dog because mm. it's a newsprint and it's a mm. massive yeah. book that i can just flip it's through cheap. and just so, you know yeah. toss well, use as a your, weapon i don't know what was your first 2008 Eliana? um that you read that you saw because it's oh, glossy paper now but it was originally newsprint yeah an actual, uh, so it, it was actually my comp. This was the first yeah. one I ever received. <laughs> they, those are, um, those I are bought nice it for glossy. myself. Yeah, and it came, and it took a little while to get here, but it was we've, awesome. We've all bought our first issue we were printed in. At least yeah. I have. I don't know if I did. <laughs> we've all walked up to the shop and gone, oh, <laughs> oh, I did that, I did that. Going back to our original topic of discussion. <laughs> I would like my dreads back that? in the center pages, please. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Your dreads like oh, instead of opening. Dreads, yeah, well, yeah, because because it's like they, first so, now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the first story generally, and like so, 2018, the format of it used to be newspaper print, and the center pages were color. So dread would get the center pages. Oh. I'm explaining this for Liana, who might not know this. Uh, the center, so everything else would be black and white, but the center two pages would be in full color. So you'd open up straight to dread because it's always the center two. So pages. you'd only have four you'd pages. Open up, there's a two double page. Sorry, I, it would have had. You'd only have four pages, pages in total. Okay. Of, of color. No, you'd have. So everything would be black and white, and the center two pages would be in full color. And so the dread story, oh, which might be six okay. pages would have that double page spread yeah, as full color page. and then the rest of it would be black and white. So it was a big deal. Those that opening spread was always a big deal. I think it was a big deal for the artist to draw because they knew it was going to be in color. And it was a big deal for the writer because they knew it was always going to be. And I think it's something we've lost a little bit by so when 2080 went to full color, it sort of moved dread to the front pages because the middle page didn't have that uh, kudos anymore. So it didn't really matter that it wasn't in the in the center spread. But I think it lost something by not being part of the center spread anymore. Let, let's, it does make it easier to read in collections. I'm going to come on to another point, but let's just touch on that point. Then. Okay, so what we're saying, one of the things is we'll talk <clears> about story again in a second, or story influences, but art style then. So mm. if you are going to do this, you have to work and do whatever we want. Do you think then that a magazine like this, anthology like this, benefits at times from being all in black and white? Or do you think that, you know, those sort of... Um, the difference of art styles that have been introduced over the years of, you know, adds that punk element. I think of things like, you know, the full sort of like painted um, strips of, sort of, you know, that have come through or the, the yeah, digital yeah. artwork and stuff. And Yeah. I, I actually think it's, it's got a good mixture. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily want color just for the sake, the sake of color, but, uh, but now, because there, there was almost when 2008 went to color, uh, it kind of had this, at the beginning, it was, you know, can you paint like Bisley? No, close enough. That'll do. <laughs> and, then, and then and then the it became time. like we're all doing. Yeah, it was a dark. And then it became, can you do you know how to use the airbrush tool in Photoshop? Good enough. Let's go. 
Uh, so it was never well served. Has made it easier. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, well, I mean, oh, there was some terrible airbrush color in, at one point. Um, mm. I, everything, everything had the texture of shiny, glossy <laughs> plastic. It was terrible. But uh, as as people got more of a handle on digital coloring, and I think as well. Um, in the rebellion era, there was there was a bit of a letting go of okay, we can go back to having some black and white strips in this. We don't need to do full color for everything. So you end up with this kind of point where people get to choose. You know, you don't necessarily dread tends to be full color, but the other strips tend to be. Like I did a I wrote a, um, a terror tale, and I basically assumed it would be in black and white. The terror tales and future shocks can often be in black and white, um, and I just assumed it was going to be black and white, so I drew it for black and white. And I think that's and we're at a nice balance now with mm. that, where where you can get color and you can get black and white. Like Ian Colbard's work, he's coloring it himself. That's really nice. I don't necessarily know um, if it was in black. And, I'm sure he would do something different. If it was in black and white, but it's nice in color. Brink is brings a lovely looking uh, book. Whereas there's some other things that are kind of colored for the sake of being, or, or previously were colored for the sake of being. We need to fill this with color, so let's do some coloring and get it done. When and move on to the next thing. Um, but now from, we're much yeah. more, you know, from my own experience, I think you're exactly right. Cause I think, I think the, one of the great things about 2080 <clears throat> is that you're allowed to experiment. I mean, <clears throat> management will not stamp on you for trip for playing around. Cause I was yeah. commissioned to do the Hershey in black and white because Hershey's traditionally been a black and white strip. Um, and I said, well, you know, it's printed in color. So can, if it's in black and white, but I can make it a color like green or red or something like a spot color. And like, and he went, yeah, why not? It's like. But then one panel can be purple, one panel, or one page can be green, one page can be yellow. And he went, yeah, sure. It's like, so that, yeah, that works. And then I thought, so how can I use that for storytelling purposes? So it's like, oh, yeah. it's, my it's first a, thought would have been, can I invoice color. for color? Well, <laughs> that's another question. That's another discussion, which I had with Matt. But the, the thing is that I could then do a kind of stealth color, not color project, yeah. which is basically a black and white comic toned in color. And then mm -hmm. for storytelling effect, I can use color as a kind of hit. I can do something spectacular with if it's an explosion, suddenly it goes full color. And it's like, oh, because then you get that full of that full effect. And I cannot think of any other publisher who would give you the license to do that. It wouldn't happen. I was about to say the entire time while you both were talking about that was that experienced artists and storytellers would be able to utilize black and white very well. Mm -hmm. I think where I'm at in my career, uh, my line work is good, but like in terms of doing black and white stories, like I have not done very many of them. And so I really think like experimentation or like being able to sit down and actually have the time to execute it well is important. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I for for the first few years, like I say, going back before to what I was saying about being every short story is like a little jewel. I, I always took the, the opinion that it didn't it didn't really matter if the experiment didn't work because, you know, you're in there for one week and you're gone. I mean, so if you do something and it doesn't really work, OK, it didn't work. That's on you. But you don't you're not you're not beholden to keep doing that. I mean, I've done strips, which I'm doing one now, which is 170 pages like this is the way I've designed this guy. I'd better not change my mind <laughs> 160 pages in because that's what he looks like. Um, whereas a four page strip, you can go, do you know what? I'm going to really weirdly elongate everyone just to see what that does to the artwork. I'm going to kind of push the more kind of cartoony density of this and see what that does. I did a, a horror story where um, I thought this is, this is a four page horror story set during World War II and it kind of got a gothic horror, a, a cosmic horror element to it. I thought, be really fun if like the her horror part of it was this grotesque lime green and i that's what i did and i and i thought if i were going to do like more than four pages i wouldn't have done that because it's like well that's a horrible that's a horrible color choice to make but four pages you know it doesn't matter in the bigger scheme of things but it, and, it, and it sort of stands out then because it's different enough from everything previous and after it so it kind of suddenly mm -hmm. is like Oh, I didn't like that, but I thought that was kind of an interesting choice. It was, you know, it was a, you can be brave and you can lean on the cardliness, knowing that it's going to be gone by the next week to be brave with what you're going to try and do. I think. On, that, on that point then, just sort of like, you know, not to speak too much inside baseball, but then sort of like, so has that been, you know, um, Simon, you've talked about when you did uh, Hershey and you had those sort of those color options and they seem very open with that. <clears throat> More recently, is, has that been the case? Do you feel that sort of this magazine being punk, you know, sort of sticking that that thing and also saying keeping those things short allows you to experiment and actually should, you know, obviously is also a big part of like, if we were going to do this again, like you could go in and be like, yeah, I can do this and I could have like, you know, 
you, um, you've got this great period of Mick McMahon, the, the classic example of a guy who just kept trying new things. And by the time, in a sort of 10-year period, his style went from looking like Carlos Esguerra to looking like nobody else on this planet. And he went through four or five different iterations of his style. And obviously, he was bringing influences from Europe and different artists and all this stuff. And he was like trying these different things because he was working on like, I don't know, six pages out of, out of a story. Um, mm. He did a couple of annuals, which he colored himself, which were magnificent. And you just couldn't do that if you were doing 24 pages a month. Uh, there's just no human way possible. In fact, you can't even do it. I mean, Cool inks with 24 pages a month um, because that's a mechanic. That's a kind of like a, that, that's comic artist as machine part to produce um, product. Whereas 2000 AD is more of a kind of artistic expression because it's much shorter. Um, and yeah, you can do long runs of things, but traditionally it's been um, artists trading off with each other. And it's like an artist does four or five episodes. Another artist does five, four or five episodes. So nobody gets burned out on it. Nobody's grinding out, um, Kind of product to fit a time schedule the same the same way, um, and this has always been a strength of 2080. And one of the things that makes it so visually inventive is the fact that the artists get to screw around, uh, and it doesn't, as you say, PGA, it doesn't matter if they fuck up. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a massive advantage to the fact that it's a, a lumbering machine that will never ever stop and churns through pages at a rate of knots, and an editor who trusts the creatives to get on with the job. Who can go look? There's I don't think he has pages. a choice. I don't think he has time to, to mess yeah. around. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's basically, I mean, I, the very first gig I ever did for 2000 AD was a dread, and I sent it in. It was, I said, What do you think of that? And it was Andy Diggle at the time. And Andy went, Yeah, it's not the best. And I went, I'll redraw all of it. Mm-hmm. And I did. And he said, Why would you do that? I went, Well, do, I, I think just the way the industry, the way 2000 AD works is that you will not have time to correct me. Mm-hmm. What you will do is just not give me any more work. <laughs> So it's dead simple. So that's why I did that. But uh, yeah, I mean, once once you're sort of on board and within the 2000 AD and they and they know they can trust you to do the work within the time period, and they know that you're bringing something different. I I don't think there's an awful lot of merit. Uh, I don't think Matt wants, and I don't think there's an awful lot of merit for every single artist to be exactly the same. Mm. Like, so there is no point in you know, to, even as brilliant as Mike McMahon is, there's no point in twenty Mike McMahons. There you will know, never you, be. You a, want every well, single person to be different. That's it. There will never be a 2000 AD house style. No, it will always be. But the house style is to be different and to be inventive. Yeah. Uh, it's it's one... like it's like um, I, it's like the, uh, the expression about pornography. I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. It's it's. I don't know what 2000 AD house art style is, but I, I I can sort of know what it is, and when I see it, I can go that. Yeah. That doesn't look normal or right mm. but it's one of the things i think is interesting about the regime issues is that they are opening that doorway up more you know they're they're allowing much more kind of softer you know more kind of rounded uh friendly or open kind of art styles in that 2080 mm. would have been much more spiky about previously and and so that and that's interesting because you get different flavors of things in there uh and, and you know so <laughs> talk of flavors there's one of the things i wanted to go back to you talked about we, talked about, uh, we mentioned like ram v and some others but one of the things you mentioned was this idea of different storytellers we talked about well to me it just, it just sprung in my mind you know we, we have um, an american um a scot an, an irish and then obviously i'm um all english it's all western and i'm something like what about other sort of you know storytelling techniques do you think 2008 could be well, I, I did Asian mention Ginger and Eagle. eastern and sorry I, I did mention Junjo Ito. You did, and that's what that's what sort of sprung my head. So I was actually thinking, like, you know, is there is there other, you know, would, would it then would there be benefit then of exploring sort of storytelling techniques of, you know, obviously like you know. I mean, we are getting that by the back door because um, manga has been so powerful. It's such a yeah. powerful influence on Western comics in the last twenty years. Um, everyone coming up that I see is very manga influenced mm. um, for like two generations now, and almost all the women coming in are manga influenced because there weren't comics for them in any other style. So that's, mm-hmm. you know, we're getting a lot of that, which is, you know, it's great. It's, it's, it's reinvigorating. I think, I think what's interesting is, is that 2000 AD, I think, has, it has more commonality with what manga does than it does with what American comics do, both mm-hmm. in terms of the kind of storytelling, which um, I think with a lot of manga, it's usually collected and, and and it's usually collected in anthology titles, but also it's a much broader range of genres. There is no, yeah. you know, there's no singular genre in, in um, uh, manga. 
in in the way, same way there is an American comics where you can go, well, American comics are all superheroes, although it's not strictly speaking. No. Superhero image images don't play a lot of the field. Uh, and Boom and, and um, TKO and there's a whole bunch of new publishers now doing a lot of different stuff that are very, again, play to the but it tends to fit very in clearly into genre niches and mm-hmm. existing intellectual property. So it tends, yeah. American comics tend to be very corporate. Um, it's an yeah. awful lot like a lot of licenses. Comic, yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of licenses. Can we make like, another license that will make us right? Comics are weird, making yeah. cheap versions of Transformers. You know, it's like yeah. Eh, okay, yeah. To, to speak, Which, there's in. nothing wrong with that, but I definitely think like 2000 AD has never looked at uh, any of the progs and been like, ah, yes, this is our licensing goldmine to now make a movie. They've cared about comics, which is mm. the most important part is the storytelling I mean, aspect. There, there probably is some members of the team internally going, "We, if only we could do this, we could license this as this. But at the comics making part of it is going, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, yeah, licensing is notoriously so, problematic. Rebellion area. has like video games and stuff, right? Yeah, like yeah, they yeah. already have their niche, which is great. Like there's, and wasn't there supposed to be like a Rogue Trooper movie? Like whatever happened to that, you know? Well, every, I mean, all of those things take a billion years, and you know, mm-hmm. and the factors no, are, of course, are always. Yeah. But, you know, they're, they're, nothing's Rebellion ever is very like careful Simon with their licenses. Like Simon was saying, though, American comics are, uh, I mean, even when they do have anthology-ridden news stories, there's usually always a thematic to it and always based off of, yeah. like, you know, a specific thing. Or I, I think DC and Marvel can be quite ed- editor-led rather than mm. creative-led. I think there's yeah. a lot of sort of, here's here are the gaps we need to fill. We need a Superman story. And it needs to be about this and oh, I mean, th- get the writers just, in. And just, uh, yeah. anecdotally, this there's is a reason Marvel comics all look like that because they want to have the yeah. same artist. They want the whole, all of it. House style. The same. Yeah. It's a house yeah. style. And they, they want that. That's deliberate just, because they want to be able to interchange artists because we are flaky. Just to get that reliable. This generation is definitely breaking away from that. Like I see a lot mm. of my favorite mm. editors doing really cool, like, shorts and like one shot mm. anthologies with a whole bunch of really cool up and coming creators that don't have house style and that are able to, you know, tell new stories, but the likelihood of them having another chance of doing another thing with the license seems lesser. Whereas I feel lucky that I've even worked with 2080 twice and have talked to Matt mm. twice, let alone like as an American too, you know, How many words mean? did he say? <laughs> I mean, I'd have to go back One hand to the emails. So I've never even seen face to face. So, like, um, Fam- but... famously very taciturn. Yes. Not the, but... <laughs> Having said that, Matt does at least give comments, and they may be one word, but it's a comment. Whereas a lot of American publishers, it's like upload listen, to server. That's listen, it. Listen, I, I, I mean, I practically framed the one comment about one panel I did in a in a in a twelve episode the... thing that was yeah. like this. But print that, take yeah. that yeah. one to the it, keeper. put it yeah. above your computer. Yeah. It. Mm. So, Leanne, to, to go around to you. So, we, we talked previously about sort of influences, and, and, and you were saying, you know, the Simon sort of said that, um, or sort of framed that sort of, you know, a lot of female um, creators coming through are manga influence and stuff. So, I was just curious to sort of say, you know, being an American stuff, do you? And we talk about the arts and stories. So, what, what is your, what was your influence, or what was your in? You know, what was your sort of uh, comics? influences uh, you know as, as a kid and stuff um archie digest was typically like something that you could get at the grocery store and like i grew up uh pretty poor in poverty <laughs> so that was like primarily probably the only uh comics that i got until you know i could get uh you know money from doing random things down the street or whatever and i think i have purchased like spider-man comics or something at the time but when I actually had real money from like, you know, summer job or something, it was actually manga. And like I had probably a hundred for a teenager. That's a lot, I think. And, you know, you'd sit at Barnes and Noble um, for hours and hours with friends, like reading that sort of stuff, um, which primarily led me back into American comics and like feeling comfortable enough to go to a comic shop and like um explore like what I wanted to like and you know the primary licensing was like Robin like I really enjoyed DC comics like in my teenage years and things like that so um which you know eventually leads to indie comics and actually my first indie comics were by a UK pair which is you know Kieran and Jamie uh their phonogram 
uh, run and like, I think why the last man were the first like indie comics I really read. Mm. So, um, it kind of went all over the place, but you're right. Like for an audience that is, uh, vast, vastly deprived in the market, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons why I would love to curate an entire prog would be just to be like, you know, give it to a little girl and be like, you can read this. It's totally cool. Like, it's really rad. But I grew up going to like punk shows and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like, I was into all that kind of stuff. I was into horror movies and weird shit. So um, I think, you know, that probably isn't the case. I'm sure there's tons of, you know, women that read 2000 AD or did growing up. But um, I think there could be really cool opportunities with the format. So I agree. Yeah. Like a, an all international um, program. Going back to this idea of 2008, you know, this word punk sort of expanded around, but there are certain there are certain uh, creators in my head that sort of get a pass. Like I say, Al Ewing can go off and write, um, you know, uh, in, in, um, Immortal Hulk and then can come back and do, um, you know, a Zombo or a Dread or whatever he wants. And mm. then it's sort of like, oh, it's cool, we can come back. Do you think, though, if, say, Karen Gillen and, and you know um, someone like that was to come back who did like you say glance off 2008 and was to come in or 2008 was to do sort of like you know a heavy hit issue would there be the risk of it being oh it's selling out and bringing in talent or no like, you know, I mean it... I think I think that, I, like, let's let's be honest we all I think we're all we all know that as far as the average 2008 reader is concerned if jo- if John Wagner isn't writing the dread it doesn't count anyway. So, you know, it, it doesn't count anyway. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think that would be a problem. I think you will always get someone who going, Oh, now they're, they're trying to sell out. I think, well, yeah, it's a comic. It, try, it tries to sell. That's, <laughs> that's its primary purpose. Is I was to about sell. to say everyone somewhere, someone will complain about something. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, oh, just this isn't a point. Like, yeah. yeah. 2018 so, used yeah. to have its own very clear stream. You, you know, it brought its own talent in. <clears throat> Because 2008 mm-hmm. could never afford to get talent from outside. This is a mm-hmm. crucial point, actually. Is 2008 has been a constant generator of new talent because it had to, because it can constantly bring in young people from the, from the lower end who had who would work for peanuts. Um, and now, you know, the the page rates are mm, not great, but you, you do it because it's fun and because it's a good thing because it's your you know your alma mater. Um, but um, you know, the, Mike Perkins, I know what Mike Perkins gets paid by DC. So it's like, I think it's going to be a challenge getting him back. Um, and, you know, that's... Well, this the goes thing. back to my original point, which is you get one of those, you've got to go with a lower budget end with another artist. <laughs> I, I don't think, think you can right compensate. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's an awful lot of people in. <laughs> what the sustainability, you've got some, like, uh, idea of it, though, I think equals out to always having stories that look like they all belong together like a lot of the art and a lot of the stories do really well i think because they're either bringing in the same talent that they know is reliable and dependable or they are bringing in new talent to see like how fresh or like how interesting they can make the issue yeah that's a good point i think so there's the page right i'm just about i think you so basically we're saying we want fifa manager a game of fifa manager but for 2000 ad yeah <laughs> um, Smith yeah. Simulator. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you obviously you wouldn't you wouldn't put everyone's actual page rates in there. You would call it Galactic Groups, and that's how you'd pay everyone. Like so it. you know, course, uh, Carlos yeah. Escara would get twenty Galactic Groups, and then you'd, mm. you know, I might get four. I don't know it whatever, writes, whatever it way writes, that works. It writes itself, doesn't it? it absolutely right. It itself. does. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I think but so. I, like but to... I mean, wait, like there's been some American talent that's come to 2000 AD that have done spectacularly well. Like uh, Chris Burnham, for example, I think has done some great stuff in 2018. Um, he did a phenomenal uh, Future Shock story, and I think he did a he did a, he's done a couple of covers. I think he's done, and maybe he's done a dread as well. But um, I think he did a dread for the free comic book day issue. Um, I think. Uh, but yeah, so you know, there, there's I I would bring him as as well to do something in the Future Shock area would be good. That, that, um, that's a good area where you can do that experiment, couldn't you? You could bring in then for something like if you wanted to just do it go yeah. back to 
uh, you know, Leanna's point about having that sustainability, about having that variance. You don't bring him in to do everything then. You bring him in to do a no. special thing. You bring him in to do a future yeah. shock or a dread or a, a one-off. And then you have... So, I mean, you, you, set, you set aside... So, you, for example, in, in this one that I'm building in my head, you've got a Jimmy McKelvey dread followed by a Chris Burnham thing, or maybe James Harren, uh, you know, a, a terror tale with James Harren, something like that. I'm picking artists because that's what I like. But, <laughs> you know, you get Al Ewing to write something for James Harren and, and whatever it is, I don't care. And obviously, you know, um, uh, or maybe Al writes a Zombo and you bring in, um, uh, uh, um, what do you call him? Oh, Henry? God. My, yeah, Henry Flint, obviously. Mm. You mm. keep Henry Flint in there. No matter what else you've got around you keep Henry in there because he's the closest thing I think this generation has to guys like um, uh, uh, guys like Kevin O'Neill and McMahon. The closest in the sense that he's so out there, yeah. <laughs> it's so weird and out there. But at the same time, it's so quintessentially 2000 AD that you kind of he just belongs there, and he just you know he's bedrock of of, of the thing. But all equally so different from you know if you, if you want to kind of compare. Um, artists, you would kind of go, well, Jamie McKelvey, the closest comparison to the artists that I like when I was, you know, and, and when I was 12 would be a Steve Dillon kind of type, maybe, you know, uh, and then Henry's close to a Kev O'Neill and those, those things just work magically together when they're, they're sat, you know, it's like nobody wants a packet of, um, uh, a packet of quality treats where they're all exactly the same. You, you want, you want every flavor in your sweet packet to be slightly different, I think. Dylan was going to be on my and... list if we had to pick like who, uh, you know, I mean, all, all the people I want on my artist list are all dead. <laughs> well, except is, for, that's except why I was like, Israeli. I didn't bring it up. <laughs> yeah, it's all I a mean, fancy. This is a fancy issue. This is the fancy that we have the power mm-hmm. to, to, they can do that one strip. Let's assume Tharg the Mighty can bring back the How day. have we not answered that it's just us three writing and drawing the entire thing it, on different rotation? Oh, that's a good idea. Else? Missed that's opportunity. <laughs> I mean, I didn't want to say anything, but clearly I'd be drawing all the dread and, and anything else in it. I'd just draw whatever I fancy. I fancied. would love to write dread. That'd if you could do that. So fun. Think of it. Let's do it then. You you are going to, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll sort of start to look at rounding this out soon, but that's, so let's do that as a final thing then. You have got to do, you can choose any script and you're going to do the writing or the art and you can bring something in or whatever, but you can do say oh, three. Oh, I, 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 I think I know what I do. I think I would do a, a Rogue Trooper, but the Dark Knight Returns Rogue Trooper. The final statement for Rogue Trooper. Oh, oh, the, 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 the this is the this is the end point. Promise. There is no. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. Promise I mean, to if kill I, him. If, oh <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, well, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily. I mean, in much the way the Dark Knight Returns does doesn't necessarily kill Batman, but it it, mm. it does it does represent a point where you can say to someone, "That's the end book. That's mm. the end." You know, you can read sequels to it if you like, but no one in okay. their right mind is going to actually do that. No, I wouldn't recommend it. I just like that. So, right, so that's that's one. I'm gonna take that. So we've taken that's what I would do. So we're taking old man Ray. I, um Leanna, what are you thinking? I uh hope that Matt doesn't watch this because I've pulled myself back from like emailing to ask this one day, but like I would love to do a Judge Mortis short of any kind. I would write Andra, I guess. Like I think he's just a weird just such dark humor, bad. You could do so much with that lack or build of character development and also great to draw skulls why not <laughs> yeah yeah Again, i just have a fascination it's... with him i don't know why as an american like that's you know i do i do have one other thing i'd like to revisit but I, it's so similar in conceit which is um haphazard i'd like to revisit haphazard and middle-aged haphazard a kind of 20 years later so haphazard was written and drawn by steve dillon and he was a, a bloke who bummed around the galaxy essentially and didn't really have any purpose or point but had little kind of run-ins with things and i think there's a, an interesting story to be told about middle-aged men well, if you <laughs> so you're like, i found my market <laughs> find my market all, i mean it, yeah, it exactly to the readership i mean <laughs> Well, I think you're right. One of the things to say, though, is to go back and there are sort of, a, you know, let's say a vault of characters and you could have that final statement on a whole number of them. And we talked about re- yeah, reboot, re- well, yeah, revitalizing like characters. Has, has, well, 2000 AD has precedent in terms of aging a character up. So mm. it's not unusual to kind of go back and go, 
this is that character now aged in real time and this is where they are now. And I think there's enough. Uh, and 2018 did do that. I think I think they did a strip a strip called Where Are They Now or something. I think a few years ago. Where um, well, I say a few years ago, everything's mm-hmm. a few years ago now. I they could have been 50 years. Ago. Who knows? Time's lost all meaning. Uh, Pre pandemic, 10 years ago, let's say um, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. It was. Where, where are they now? And they take really obscure B list characters that were sort of incidental to the main stories and go where is that character now and just sort of tell that story which is a fun little thing you can do in 2018 because you know you, you know that once they they tie off that knot that you're never really going to revisit them again anyway no, no one is unless they get a funny idea for one um, yeah yeah by play with that toy put it back in the vault and just forget about it really move on what is simon's though I'm saying, Simon, what, what are your thoughts what have you got i've actually given some some thought to this um so the, the Alan Moore Dread, I, the six-page Dread Alan Moore would definitively write, and that would be the end of Dread, uh, would have to be drawn by Ron Smith for me. Because Ron mm. Smith is my definitive Dread artist. And I love all the other really? ones. And there's some fantastic Because Ron Smith made Mega City 1 a real, vibrant, living, breathing thing. Um, his Dread is this giant, brutal slab of beef. And that's fine. That's fine for me. Because Dread is not a character. He's a f- plot function. Um, but the Mega City One is a vibrant, living thing under Ron Smith, and Ron Smith created it more than anyone, any other artist. So that that I want, I want to see that. Um, and I know that can never happen because one of them's dead, and the other one is might as well be dead, as far as comics is concerned. Um, Nemesis the Warlock, because Mills O'Neill, to my mind, is the best comic strip ever made in Europe in the last fifty years. I will stand no argument on this. Um, I'm a big fan of Rob Williams and Disraeli's work on Low Life. I think Disraeli is one of the artists I really look forward to seeing everyone when I, whenever I see 2000. Disraeli is fantastic. I love his stuff. I don't know how to do it, which is why I like it, because I don't understand it. And it's like, I, I always look for artists I don't understand because those are the ones I'm going to learn something from. Um, now, what I, I'm going to be really cheeky here and say, I want to see some Nikolai Dante written by Robbie, but drawn by uh, John Watkiss, who I think is a great lost British comics talent who died far too young. Um, and I think he was a genius and I would love to see what he would do with Dante. He wouldn't have done it. There's no way he would have even touched it with a barge pole. Uh, but I, I would, in my dreams, love to see John come back from the dead to draw D- Nikolai Dante. Um, and also on that note, Ron Embleton, who I think is one of the greatest artists that Bridget never produced. And he never worked in 2000 AD. He was too busy making a lot of money from Penthouse. And Bob Guccione paid him top dollar um, and 2000 AD couldn't compete. Uh, but I think he's one of the greatest artists and I'd love to see what he'd do with Nikolai Dante. It would just make my heart sore. That's it. That's a wonderful collection, yeah. Mm. I like the idea of that. Um, I'm just going to head back around to Liana. Any other ideas? Off the back of that? I mean, I'm, I'm a bit sort of floored by that. So I'm still thinking, in my head, I'm actually just running through and going, yeah, this sounds really amazing. Um, when can we have that uh, uh, 2008 winter special coming out this year? There's summer special featuring uh, Simon Fraser's lineup. Uh, I'll get on it. Uh, Leanne, any any other ideas that you want to be sort of exploring? Um, in terms of artists and like oh, story yeah. ideas? Yeah, any ideas um, for strips, artists and, and creators you'd want to put on it? Gosh. Um, it would be cool to see a future shock done by my friend Matt Emmons. I think he's an uh, incredible untapped talent of weird heavy line work and bizarre creatures and just weird shit and he's just so fucking talented sorry excuse my language he is one of my best friends uh and so love to champion him um i i'm like looking around my room for books like i said i came ill prepared because i as a comic collector here in the states like i could list off so many like i would love to see you know zadarsky on uh weird just it he would he would one do of the brilliant. b-list characters um, in the vault like yeah, just they, they, he would he revive would do, something that no. everyone would fall would in love with a great job on the what's it the triple brain what's his name the guy with the oh, abelard board. snaz yeah uh, yeah he'd do a great one of him <laughs> i think he, the the genius abelard snaz it's like the triple decker brain yeah with the triple decker mm-hmm. i can see him both writing and drawing that i can picture mm-hmm. that right now yeah um, Christian Ward would be, I don't even know if he's done 2000 AD, has he? No, he's another Brit that sort of escaped it. Yeah. Escaped um, the orbit of it. Which is interesting that I'm listing a whole bunch of 
British creators, uh, a lot of, I mean, I still just, I have a lack of knowledge that is burning a hole in my brain <laughs> for a lot of really cool creators that I haven't discovered yet because I haven't been able to, you know, read the collected issues. But um, Matt knows my email if he ever wanted an American uh, <laughs> listing. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to like list all my friends, you know, so. Hopefully it'll happen. It'll be a good influence. I think basically what I want to wrap up on this is just a quick thought is basically say, in the Fantasy Nerve Centre, I think we've covered everything. And basically, I think the, what I've got down to is the wonderful idea that 2000 AD is actually open to so many ideas. We can have different types of story, different types of art, all these different creators. So to actually know, to not nail this down to a single issue um, is incredibly difficult. And um, it's been a hell of a conversation uh, to get through all these different topics. And I just want to thank uh, three guests. Uh, Simon Fraser, thank you very much. Uh, for contributing it's been fantastic talking to you thanks for inviting thank you me. very much uh liana it's been wonderful to have you on um and, uh, me on. Uh, i'm hoping that matt is listening and starts sending you some of the collected editions <laughs> i think there's some fantastic stuff that you, you definitely need to see uh and pj thank you very much for contributing as well it's been wonderful i'm sorry to show you my collected editions up there i'm very jealous if they fell, Listen. If they fell on me they'd really hurt that's yeah. I will tell there. everyone there that, like, despite being at Thought Bubble, I do not want to roll back with a suitcase full of books. So yeah. <laughs> don't do it. I would pay for shipping. <laughs> Is there a dead body in this case? Yeah. Yeah. No. We'll it's just a lot we, of wood. We can get things to your door. That's it. Shipping's not too expensive. Also, you know, we'll pull some strings. I can't pull any strings. I have no strings to pull, I should say. I'm, you know, I, I just managed to sort of sneak my way in. Uh, anyway, thank you very much and, and ladies and gentlemen for watching I hope you've enjoyed this discussion it's been fantastic and I hope you're enjoying uh, Galaxy's Greatest there'll be way more panels coming on uh, and I'll be back uh, to do another one soon but uh, as I say ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for joining us uh, and again thank you to my guests uh, I really appreciate happy your time 45th yes <laughs> thank you Thar, happy for your 45 years happy birthday <laughs>